and good evening, everyone, and welcome to PerfWeb 21. It is hard for me to believe that we're already up to number 21, and of course, this Thursday will be 22, and that's going to wrap up everything that we did this year. Uh, and I've got some really neat information to tell you about, both about the program we're going to do tonight, which is going to be a great program with some incredible speakers and faculty. And we're also going to talk a little bit about what our future is. I'll probably do that first. Um, of course, I'm your host, Joe Basha. I want to welcome everyone here. You could be watching on YouTube. You could be watching on Facebook. You could be watching on the Twitter. We have it going to all of those places. And, uh, and once again, just welcome. The conversation today, the, the uh, topic today, of course, is understanding tag, what is it, and how do you interpret those graphs? And uh, of course, you know, being a bit on the older side, although I know I look very young for my age, um, tag has really evolved over many years from what was a rather cumbersome and I, th I think suspect uh, tool because it was so user dependent into something that is very automated, very easy to use, very functional, very affordable, and uh, of course, you know, very useful in targeting appropriate therapies for your uh, coagulation derangement or determining whether it is actually a coagulation der derangement or in the surgical world, which is what most of us live in, uh, not a different defect like prolinemia. Nevertheless, um, welcome to, to uh, PerfWeb, as I said. Uh, we've got a good show, and I've just got to get through the scrolling here so I know what I'm supposed to tell you. Uh, we are streaming directly to YouTube, Facebook, and the Twitter, which I told you, and you can watch from any of those locations. If you're watching on YouTube, please click the subscribe button. There it is right there. You can see it and click the notifications bell so that you can keep up with us as we continue to evolve this program. So please do that. It's very important to us. We've, we've finally gone over 500 subscribers already, and I'm excited. I would really love to see by, let's say, the first quarter of next year, March, somewhere around there, to be at 1,000. It would be fantastic. Um, to use the YouTube chat, uh, we're going to show you that right here. It's You see it right there. You have to have a Gmail email account or Google email account, Gmail, and then you can log in via that email account and use the chat. So you can do that. Please like us on Facebook. You see it right here. And uh, also follow us on the Twitter, which you see there, and share both of those. So like us watch us via these these different um, tools, but also share them with your professional colleagues, those that would be interested in being a part of, of, of this community that we're trying to build. Um, you can also be a part of the discussion by either using the chat or calling in, and here's our number. And when you see the sign that says phone lines are open, you can call that number, the phone's right here. You can be live on the air. We'll monitor the chats but we'll also, when we open the phone lines, answer uh, uh, questions, and you can talk to the uh, faculty, whoever the presenter is, uh, or anybody on the panel, and ask whatever question you would want to ask that's germane to the topic at hand. Um, look for the notifications. The New Orleans Conference will be an online. So we're evolving the, the, the program for the New Orleans Conference. For those of you who may have spent the past 12 years with us, as you know, with the New Orleans Conference, which we did one year in Las Vegas as the New Orleans Conference Las Vegas edition, we are, we're going to be changing. We're not going to be doing the program anymore as a live on-site event. We're going to ship Maybe one year, okay? Uh, the, uh, the studio audience has yelled out maybe one year. And I know that, that this has actually disappointed several people. I've gotten telephone calls from people saying, we really want to go back to the New Orleans Conference. Please don't stop doing it. Um, and there's a variety of reasons why we've done it. But I do feel that as the profession is, our professions are evolving 
and time off to go to conferences is becoming much more difficult. Uh, hospitals are reducing budgets for CEUs and the cost of the program is one thing, but then getting yourself there, the hotel expenses and everything else, and of course, potentially loss of revenue if you, don't, if you have to use PTO time uh, and not be paid while you're working, I'm being told to hurry up as well. Um, that could be a real problem. So we're gonna be shifting to more of the online world. Uh, please look for announcements. We're gonna be sending, I think that was the whole point of this is, I'm gonna be sending out a, a, an announcement uh, and it's gonna show us, uh, I'm gonna be, uh, what's it called when you present, like you're, I'm introducing MediWeb, PerfWeb, Perfusion Education, NurseWeb, and Nursing Education. These are going to be all online resources for you to be able to get all of your category one, category three, uh, any category CEU through the ABCP or through the uh, nursing boards. So you'll be able to, if you're a perfusionist married to a nurse, which is very common, or a nurse married to a perfusionist, whichever it is, um, you'll both be able to use the same resource, just one goes through PerfWeb, one goes through NurseWeb, to get your category one CEUs for your recertification. We want everything to be 100% quality. We're also looking for people who may want to be a part of our community, both from a lecturer perspective or a panel participant. And if you have any interest in that, please feel free to email me. If you don't know my email address, um, we'll put that up a little bit later. I don't think it's uh, available right now via uh, the uh, tech guys, but they'll put it up towards the end of the program and I'll give that to you. It'll be very easy and send me an email saying we'd like to participate. Um, we're also interested in doing um, collaboration with other maybe state societies, perfusion societies, nursing societies, whatever it may be, in order for us to um, work together and bring quality level education to our colleagues. Remember, all of our programs are free. They live on YouTube forever. Anyone can watch on any of the YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, whatever, Instagram, doesn't make any difference. It's all free. The only thing you will ever pay for is if you actually need the CEU certificate. So we want to make it easy. We want to make it comprehensive. We want to make it uh, streamlined. And uh, let's see. I, you know, at this point in time, I think I've exhausted myself with these opening remarks. I'm done with the opening remarks, so I'm just going to end it there and hope everybody definitely enjoys this show. Let me introduce to you, if I can, our esteemed faculty. First, to my right, is Jeff Elston. Jeff Elston is originally from Nebraska, currently resides in Madisonville, Louisiana, so that's kind of my home territory. He likes crawfish. We're gonna do some crawfish boils out here, I understand, pretty soon. And he has been working for Hemonetics for the past six years. Now, Jeff is here as a representative of Hemonetics, which, is a, which sells the tag. He has a bachelor's degree, uh, and he's also been in the medical sales, specifically with the, uh, uh, a target on diagnostics for many years. So he's here really just to sort of sound off with, have a sounding board, maybe ask some good provocative questions. Because our program is approved for Category 1 CEU, we want to be very careful about any semblance of commercial bias. So we're going to be very cautious about that and respect that, that, that boundary very, very closely. But he still has a lot of good information and a lot of good insight, and it can help the other speakers who are really high quality, very, very knowledgeable in coagulation. First will be my good friend, uh, 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 here, my good friend, I can't remember her name, Julie Wagner, <laughs> who has a, who has a, Julie, who has a PhD. She is originally from Minnesota. Now, we only see half of her face, so we got to fix that. And uh, Julie has a, uh, a PhD from the University of Arizona. She's been at the University of Arizona since about 1990s, something like that. She can ex uh, uh, go over that with you. And uh, she is a tag expert. Now, Julie has also been the editor for JECT, which is the Journal of Extracorporeal Technology, 
for the past three years, but I understand that that tenure is coming to an end. But Julie presented also last year at the New Orleans Conference. Her presentation is online, and it is really a fantastic presentation. This is going to be an extension of that and really uh, present a tremendous amount of wonderful information. So Julie, thank you so much for being willing to come to us all the way from Arizona and do this tonight. <laughs> Next to her is Dr. Oksana, Oksana Valad. I think I said that right. And originally I thought uh, that uh, Dr. Valad was from uh, Moscow, but I was corrected. She's actually from the southern part of the Ukraine, Hungarian area. She's got a lovely accent. I really enjoyed listening and talking to her. It's, I, 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 I like pretty accents and she definitely has that, but she's also at the Cedar sinai Hospital in California. So thank you, Dr. Vlad, for coming to us all the way from there to talk about tag coagulation and targeted treatment for bleeding problems, especially in the uh, operative patients, which we see a lot, and uh, spending your time to do that with us today. We just appreciate both of you so much. And you are a pathologist and with your expertise, again, being in coagulation. So. I think our plan is, oh, and we have some poll questions too. So you guys know um, on YouTube, you click on the little icon that's an I, and on uh, Facebook, it looks like a little uh, graph, like a poll. Um, so those of you in the audience, if you go do those, we'll come back and look at them. And also Julie's presentation has uh, a, uh, uh, five questions that we're going to present and you'll be able to answer those and we'll see how you guys did in terms of whether you got the questions right or not. And before we start, Julie, you're just a little offset. Like I only see half of her. Uh, guys, can we fix that? There you go. Yeah, it's you. It's you. That's it. Much, much, much better. Now, there. Now, now you look like Julie. It was really tough, Julie. I only saw half of you. Oh, and then also, Dr. Vlad, if you could back up just a teeny little bit. Oh, oh, put the camera down just a little bit. Like, reach up and tilt the camera down towards you just a little bit. There you go. Now, how's that, guys? That's good? And sit back a little bit. Yeah. Now you're good. Now you look... Everybody's beautiful. Thank you so much. Perfect. Okay, so we'll go forward with uh, with Dr. Wagner's first presentation. All right. Thank you. Let's see. Share on the screen. Hmm. Hmm. You guys see it? Yeah. All right. Does everybody see my presentation up there? Yes, I do. Okay. All right. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about interpreting the tag, talk a little and um, just the basics part of it. And then Dr. Balad will go into the more um, serious stuff about uh, coagulation. So the agenda for me is to discuss clot formation in vivo and in vitro because uh, it's important to understand the distinctions between the two relative to what you're actually getting as um, an information. And then a little bit into viscoelastic coagulation testing. Again, the basics, specifically looking at the tag, the thromboelastograph. I'll look at the measurement parameters as well as a little bit of on, on how to interpret them. And then we'll go through and do a little interpretation practice. Or again, just the basic, basic stuff um, and how to interpret what the tag is trying to tell you. So first of all, I like to talk about, when I talk about uh, viscoelastic uh, measurements, I like to talk about what actually makes a good clot in vivo. Um, and Basically, there's four, what I feel are four different uh, factors. Number one, you have to have appropriate activation and a location for the clot to happen in vivo. It doesn't happen in the blood. It happens along the, the uh, 
the wall of the vasculature. Then what has to happen is thrombogeneration generation has to get beyond a certain threshold for clot formation to go completely forward and to completion. And then um, after it reaches that threshold, you get rapid thrombin generation or a thrombin burst, where then from there you can make and create the fiber network, which is gonna cause the clot to be stable, um, increase the strength of the clot, and then allow it to be stable enough in its position so that it can do wound healing. So let's look at some of those things. So what uh, makes a clot, good clot in vivo, first of all, is the activation. And activation occurs at the zone of injury um, it, on, uh, in the vascular wall. And it's two things that are activated. The platelets um, become uh, adhere to the zone within that zone of injury um, and then activation. So they adhere and then they become activated and they're gonna generate or they're going to um, be the location for the thrombin generating or they become the thrombin generating surface. Um, and then secondly, what happens is that the coagulation cascade that you all learned in biochemistry does get activated, but it's mostly just the extrinsic pathway um, being activated by tissue factor, which comes in from outside the vasculature and under normal circumstances. Then what happens is, like I said, is the thrombin um, generation gets started with those two activation um, steps. And then, um, and then it gets beyond a certain threshold. And this is demonstrated here as here on the y-axis is thrombogeneration generation with along the uh, x-axis is time. The red is actually thrombogeneration, generation and blue is clot formation. And if you can see, you can see that thrombin generates um, along a certain timeline it, and then starts coming up. And you see that it really don't get clot formation started until it reaches a certain threshold. Once it reaches that threshold, then it just, um, the thrombin burst that occurs allows clot formation to occur very quickly. A couple of things that are happening prior to that threshold is that, as you know, there's always an anticoagulant and procoagulant forces that are trying to maintain balance. Prior to the threshold, the anticoagulant forces are stronger than the procoagulant forces. But once activation occurs with the platelets and the tissue factor on the coagulation pathway, uh, the procoagulant forces overcome the anticoagulant forces, which then allow clot formation to occur. And then at threshold, what happens is actually there's two positive feedback loops that are activated, um, and it's activated by thrombin. The first of all is more platelet activation in the aggregation and then accelerated thrombin generation. So thrombin is actually required to positively feedback the whole process. All right, next is rapid thrombin formation. Beyond that threshold and what happens there, you get localized thrombin generation. And once you get localized thrombin generation, you get localized fiber and fiber network creation or uh, structural uh, formation. So that's important to make sure that you have the um, stability of the clot. And then finally, you get strength and stability. And here it demonstrates that for strength and stability, you need platelets, fibrinogen, and that fiber network. And as you see, fibrin, fibrinogen, I mean, is absolutely required for both of those. Fibrinogen is required for platelet aggregation. And it's also required as the fibrin precursor so that you get fiber network formation. And once those things are in place, the clot will stay in place and then allow for um, wound healing to occur along the, the, uh, the vascular wall. So that's what it takes to make a good clot in vivo. We see that what's required are platelets, the platelets and the coagulation uh, pathways, both the extrinsic and the intrinsic. You need the coagulation factors to generate the thrombin. You need an environment free of anticoagulants. You need platelets free of uh, platelet inhibitors and fibrinogen, and then finally an environment free from plasmin, which is your uh, activating or factor for fibrinolysis. And this is just kind of a cartoon showing this. Again, the, the vascular surface, the platelet activation um, on the vascular surface um, causing, and then also thrombin or tissue factor activating the coagulation act uh, factors or pathways 
Then you get thrombogeneration, which comes back positive feedback to platelets and the coagulation. And again, once you get that a sufficient thrombogeneration, then you get fibrin formation, fiber network formation, and finally the blood clot. An important factor to understand um, in this in vivo environment in that if there's platelet inhibitors, if the patient is taking platelet inhibitors, it inhibits um, uh, coagulation because it doesn't allow the platelets to attach or to stick to the surface. And therefore, if you don't get platelet sticking, you don't get platelet activation, adhesion, and all this whole process here to occur. And so that's how platelet inhibitors work in vivo. All right. So how does all this relate to modern turning with TAG and why do I even bring it up? Well, um, first of all, the TAG provides observation of the clotting process in vitro, it, of the entire clotting process. And then this is just, again, kind of a cartoon, just showing slightly different of what's going on in vitro. In vitro, we activate at the, co at the coagulation uh, cascades by adding an exogenous activator, which it can be tissue factor or for the extrinsic pathway or um, kaolin for the intrinsic pathway, you get thrombin generation. Once thrombin is generated, now it activates the platelets as well as goes and reactivates and causes a, the rapid uh, thrombin generation via the intrinsic pathway um, to keep this cycle, this positive feedback going and then you get fibrin formation, fibrin network formation, and finally the blood clot. Relative to that, platelet activation by thrombin here versus the vascular surface that happens in vivo overrides the inhibition, inhibition by platelet inhibitors like uh, Plavix and such, which is why sometimes you don't see the effect of platelet inhibitors in the in vitro situation. And so it's important to understand why we may or may not see the effect of platelet inhibitors. All right, so in vitro testing, a couple caveats. Number one, you're only testing the blood. So whatever's in the blood is what's being, and its contribution to clot formation is what's being measured. And again, as, we indica as I indicated, you start monitoring at the thrombin generation phase or the coagulation phase. Um, and again, you're adding an exogenous activator. With the intrinsic uh, pathway, you add kaolin, which gives us the basic TEG um, uh, tracings that we normally see with the TEG 5000. And if you um, use a tissue factor, you'll activate the extrinsic pathway. And that's what they do, um, or one of the factors that are used to activate um, and to show the rapid TEG, which I won't be talking about today. I'll mainly be just be talking about the, the basic thing. Um, all right, so in this situation, the platelet now doesn't have, is not a primary activator of clot formation, rather it's playing a cofactor role. And as you can see from the um, intrinsic and extrinsic pathways here, the platelets are have always have been play, uh, in this uh, assay conditions um, playing as a cofactor. Um, and so that's where they're at. And then also I wanted to think, make sure you pay attention to the fact that you also need calcium as a cofactor in these situations. So if the patient is low on calcium, you may not get good coagulation because of that. All right. So what does in vitro testing do for you? Number one, it provides information on the potential of blood components to form clot. So it just is showing the potential of the blood components to form clot. Um, and the advantage is by doing that, you can identify some of the missing blood components if the blood does not clot. If the bleed, if a patient is bleeding and you see an abnormal tracing on the tag with this in vitro testing, you can pretty much indicate which component is missing. Um, and then add that component and hopefully stop the bleeding. The disadvantage of in vitro testing is that you may not be able to see everything. We're not measuring everything. Again, remember, we're missing the vascular component. And so what can happen is that you could still have a perfectly normal tank, but you might have suture deficiency if the hole is too big to, for the clot to form across that. Um, again, as I indicated, you could have some vascular endothelial dysfunction or platelet dysfunction such that the platelets don't stick. 
again, if the platelets don't stick, you're not going to get good clot formation. And then endogenous inhibitor of some sort, such as nitric oxide, you could have um, platelets not sticking. And then, of course, also, uh, many of us know as perfusionists, uh, um, and as you're getting ready for the patient to go up to the ICU, you may want to make sure that the pressure never gets above too much because that could tear the, the clots away from and recause bleeding. So it's not necessarily a deficiency of the process itself, but just of the stability of that clot. And as I indicated before, you cannot see, at least on the TEG 5000 with the kaolin activated, you can't see the platelet inhibitor effect. You do need to use a modified test called platelet uh, mapping for that. Okay. So a TED technology, again, for those not familiar with it, you use whole blood. Um, you can either use it straight from the patient right into uh, the cup of the situation and monitor it, or you can citrate the blood, send it to the lab, and then have it reconstituted in the lab so you can still monitor the TED. It monitors clot formation um, from the time it's initiated to the final clot uh, maximum strength of the clot. And then if there's fibrinolysis, you can actually see that. Um, and that's what I mean by and beyond. Just to, as a caveat, the routine clotting time, such as the PT, PTT, all you're looking at is initial fibrin formation. So only the initial part of that um, whole clotting process are you seeing with the routine clotting times, which is probably why they don't always correlate with what we see with the tag. What are some of the monitor, the parameters monitored with tech technology? We can measure the clotting times, just like with the routine clotting time, except it's a little different. Um, time to initial clot formation, which we call initiation. Secondly, we can look at the rate of clot formation, which is going to give us some information about thrombogeneration, generation, how fast it's being generated, as well as how fast the fibrinogen is being converted to fibrin in the fibrin network. Thirdly, we can look at clot strength. How strong is the clot in its ability to withstand those uh, pressure and flow uh, effects in the vasculature? And there it's mostly related to platelets and fibrinogen concentrations. And then finally, clot stability, which is the how long the clot will stay there um, to allow it to do its work of um, wound healing. And so basically clot stability means no fibrolysis or very little fibrolysis, and it's also related to clot structure, as we'll talk a little bit about. So that's what TEG technology can give you. And so let's look at what the basic TEG tracing will show you. So this is a kind of a cartoon version of what a TEG tracing looks like. Um, we, the first half is coagulation process. And then once it reaches its maximum uh, strength, then if fibrolysis is present or active in the blood sample, then you'll see that clot breakdown. And again, here are all the, the, the different parameters tested, and I'm going to go through the... Where'd she go? What happened? Uh oh, we lost you, Julie. Uh oh, oh. Well, let's let this, let's let everybody know we have a technical difficulty. Um, technical? No. Just wait one second. Difficulty. Uh huh. We. Uh huh. Lost sound. Lost your sound. Julie, can you hear us? If you can, give us a sign. Mm -hmm. So what do we want to do? Um, yeah, hey, Julie, can you call in on the phone? If she can hear us? Mm. Call in to 281. Put, put the, uh, here, 281-738. That was a good idea. 7906. 7906. Mm -hmm. Julie? Um, there she is. 
Hey, Julie, is that you? Yes, it is. Okay, go ahead. Hey, that was great idea. Studio audience once again came through. And uh, right. uh, so go ahead. You could do it on the phone like this, and I, we don't know what happened to your to your sound, but go on. Okay. Uh-oh. Yeah, you might want to turn the sound down on your computer all the way. Oh. Oh, keep going. Okay, go ahead, Jules. Okay. It's good now? Yes. All right. Sorry. <laughs> Gotta love technology. All right. So, the basic tech tracing, we start with initiation, which is the R value, which is clotting time. Again, that's uh, that. Then we have the rate of clot formation. Again, that's associated with the rate of formation of the fiber network as well as thrombin generation. We also have clot strength, which is the maximum clot strength, which is your MA value. And then also clot stability and breakdown, which typically is defined by the LY30 value. Under normal circumstances, um, this is what you're mainly going to be associated with in the operating room, at least very infrequently in my experience that I see fiber alliances. It's somewhat like porno. If you see it, you know you have it. And, um, but otherwise, most of the time, you're just going to be associated with R, the angle, and the MA value to uh, interpret the what's going on with your patient. Um, and like I said, typically minimal fibrinolytic activity, mainly because most patients are treated with an anti-fibrinolytic agent also. So. All right, so let's look at what are some of the determinants of the parameters. The R value. The main determinants of this are going to be the type of activator you use, whether it's Kalin or tissue factor. Tissue factor is going to be very fast versus the Kalin, which is going to be a little bit slower to activate. So the R value is going to be longer with Kalin versus with tissue factor. The main factor contributing to the R value is going to be your coagulation factors, your activity and um, availability of coagulation factors. Of course, assay conditions under most circumstances, they're pretty well um, normalized or standardized, but temperature, pH, calcium levels, as well as the presence of an anticoagulant can influence the R value. And then finally, platelets. They're going to be um, not a primary factor, but again, they're a, a required cofactor for activation of the coagulation pathway. All right. The rate of formation, which is your angle, typically your angle, um, is going to be influenced by your coagulation factors, mainly because you need those to generate uh, thrombin, and then, of course, to generate the fiber network. Again, assay conditions, fibrinogen is going to be, uh, that's mainly offered as a coagulation factor, but sometimes it's looked at a little bit differently as a, uh, its own little factor. Uh, factor 13A is required, to, or fa factor 13 is required to be activated to get your fiber network, and again, platelets as your cofactor. Finally, we get to clot strength, your MA, mainly associated with platelet function and um, number um, due to its aggregation of those platelets. But again, for platelets to aggregate, you have to have fibrinogen. And, um, and again, factor 13A because everything holding it together um, with the fiber network. And then finally, clot stability, the fiber analysis activation, which would be your plasmin levels. And then clot strength or structure to a certain extent will also influence your um, vulnerability to fibrinolysis. So if you have low thromba generation, oftentimes, you'll, even if you don't have a full on um, activation of fibrinolysis, you're still going to be vulnerable to any little bit of uh, plasma that could be in the blood and therefore to clot fibrinolysis. So it's something to keep in mind that if you don't have a really strong clot, that you're going to have, um, even though you might not see this type of fibrolysis, it's still going to be um, vulnerable to fibrolysis and breakdown. 
All right. So again, the tag tracing, initiation, build up, maximum strength, and breakdown along the x axis is time. Amplitude is along the y axis, which is along here. So let's look at that. So with the RK and angle, as you saw, the coagulation factors are involved. With fibrinogen is involved when they get to the K angle at the ink. The platelets are involved once we mainly get to the MA, but as cofactor, all these other ones. So basically what I was trying to show in this slide was that um, during the whole process of clock, uh, you have all the, all the elements. Hey, Julie. Yeah. Yeah, we're having some kind of strange feedback. Um, who, who, do you, who? Yeah, do you have your speaker muted? Your speaker, Julie? It is now. Um, yeah, it's still really bad feedback. Dr. Vallad, do you have your speaker muted a or turned down a little bit? Maybe, can we mute her microphone? Dr. Vallad's? Julie, can you talk? Yep, I'm talking. Oh, we hear you. That's Is it. it. Per oh, that's good. That's perfect, Dr. Vallad. Perfect. Whatever you did, it's perfect. It may not have been you at all. It's just coincidental. But I think we're good. We got it okay. all? Okay, Julie, go ahead. I'm so sorry. That's all right. So basically what I wanted to show in this one oh, is yeah. that even That's though fine. these different uh, parameters have specific things that are contributing to it, um, in reality, all of the factors are interacting during the, um, the coagulation process. So, all right. All right, so interpretation again, time versus amplitude. Um, when you're looking at a tracing uh, along the down along the x-axis here, you'll see the parameter, RK, angle, MA, LY30, and then other ones if you have it set up that way. The next one is line is the unit, minute, degrees, um, amplitude, or millimeters, percentage. The actual value that this tracing is giving you would be the next line. And then your normal range would be the last one. And the normal range is determined based on um, when you validate the tag, when you bring it into your institute, to get the normal range for your. So. All right, so when you start with interpretation, a couple questions you should always ask is what is the patient's status? Are they bleeding, not bleeding? Because it will determine how you kind of look at the tag to try to get and then also always look at the um, that the patient has. Hey, Julie, we lost you again. Can you not hear me on my phone? Well, we I don't know what where the problem's coming from. The guys are trying to figure it out. There's some kind okay. of, uh, you know, we're all coming from different parts of the country. And you know how the Internet is, I guess, feedback somewhere. But I think we may have got it figured out. Are we good, guys? Julie, I think you just hung up on Julie. Julie, you there? Yeah, yeah, Julie's gone. No, she's not there. I'm telling you, I just uh, Yeah. I'll call her back. It's all right, we'll figure it out. Julie, can you talk? Oh, there she is. Yeah, Jules, go ahead. All right. We got so, you back. Uh, I think we're good now. All right. So you may want to start all over again with example one. Okay. Um, okay, so basically this is, like I said, um, what is patient status? Always a good question to ask. Is there sufficient calcium for the patient at the patient level? And then, as I said, these are your parameters, the unit your value, and your normal range. So one of the first things you do is to look to see which one's out of range. Um, and so in this case, the R value is out of range. It's greater than 9, which is your normal upper normal value. But all the rest are normal. So an interpretation of this tracing might be that you have slow initiation of the R value, which is your initiation, which could lead to a bleeding risk 
due primarily to the fact that you have low clotting factors. And so, um, you know, if the patient is bleeding sufficiently, you might need to add clotting factors in the form of FFP or whatever you have on uh, available um, to stop that from happening. Um, the other possibility in this case, because we look at what type of uh, test we ran, which was just a Kalin activated test. If there's heparin on board, that won't, this, um, you won't be able to, I mean, this, you don't know if heparin is actually causing this. So it could be anticoagulant test. So how do we figure out if the anticoagulant is present, in this case, heparin? So one of the ways you can do that is you have to use specific assay conditions where you use a cup and pin um, set up that is coated with heparinase. So it's going to eat away all the heparin that's in the blood sample and give you some uh, different... And then you run both the tests side by side on the PEG 5000. So this is showing you the plain cup, which is without heparinase, and the green um, tracing, which is the heparinase cup. And then you get uh, factor results for both of these tracings. And as you can see, there's um, a... Provide, provides information about whether or not you reverse your protamine. But in this instance, it suggests that there's a very small amount of heparin present. And the main reason is because the R value for the heparinase cup is less than the R value for the, the other, um, the plain cup, suggesting that there's a little bit of heparin on board. If the patient is still wet and the surgeon is requiring it, a little bit more protamine probably would not be out of... Um, of question, but on the other hand, if the patient's not really bleeding, you might not have to do anything. You can just wait and see. But now you kind of have some information as to what could the possible problem be. All right, so and this is another case with a little bit more uh, indicating a difference between the protamine or the plain cup and the heparinase cup. In this case, uh, again, the green is the heparinase and the black is the plain cup. It's post-protamine. So now we look and we see that the R value for the black one, which is the plain cup, is 22.8, way high. And for the R value for the green cup is um, still a little bit high. The number, what the information from this that we get is that the heparin is not reversed. Um, so adding more protamine would be probably a number one type of treatment to do. And then you still have the potential for uh, low clotting factors because the R value is still a little bit elevated. So again, you check, you reverse the heparin um, so that these both line up with the heparinase and the non-heparinase cup, um, and then determine if the patient needs. Is, is they still bleeding? And if so, now you know if, if the, again, the R value is elongated, it might be a, a clotting factor issue. And so from that, you can get um, to the next stage. So the next example, um, again, just asking questions, what are the ones out of range? In this case, the 3RK and LY30 are all within range, but it looks like the MA and the angle are both a little bit decreased, suggesting that it's either a platelet issue or maybe even a fibrinogen issue. And so now we have hemorrhagic risk due to low platelets, which is your MA value, um, either a number issue or a function, but typically both, number and function are going to be decreased, and or low fibrinogen levels uh, relative to your alpha level, uh, value. And so again, you can figure out what the best uh, way to address this is. With now with fibrinogen act with fibrinogen uh, concentrates available, maybe treating with fibrinogen first. Um, but again, that depends on your hospital and how you go about um, with your algorithm that you might generate. Example three. Now we have a little bit different situation. We have our value is okay, our LY30, even though it's a little bit. It's still within range. What we see mainly is a high MA, so an elevated MA, an elevated angle, and a decreased uh, K value. So the decreased K and the elevated angle suggest that you have a very rapid 
um, thrombin generation, fibrin uh, network formation, as well as high platelet function. And now we might be in a situation where we have hypercoagulable risk at risk for stroke or some other type of situation, due to pla- mainly due to platelet hypercoagulability, but you still have to worry about the possibility of fibrinogen issues in that case, too. So, again, looking at your patient, what are they at risk? Do they, are they at risk because of whatever procedure was done or their history? Are they going to be at risk for a stroke? If so, then you might want to do something to decrease the hypercoagulability of those platelets. Um, so, again, the tag can give you that information. Um, here's another example where uh, we have hypercoagulable risk due to enzymatic, which is that first part where you have the coagulation cascade aspect of it. You have a low, M, a low R, a low K, a high angle, and a high MA. So now we have both enzymatic hypercoagulation, coagulation, as well as platelet hypercoagulability. Now you have a couple options of how to treat this. You could hit the enzymatic pathway with an anticoagulant or potentially a platelet inhibitor. Again, looking at the patient conditions and what are they really at risk for relative to that. And then example five, wow, everything's normal. So this, these are the best ones to have at the end of a case to um, if the patient is not bleeding. But what about if the patient, um, well, in this case, it just demonstrates in normal in vitro clotting. But what if the patient is actually bleeding? What can you gain what information can you gain from the fact that you have a normal tag, but the patient is bleeding? And so, again, this is where why I kind of went over the missing elements at the beginning of the presentation, because now what are some of the missing elements that could happen? We could have a suture deficiency, and that's not going to show up on the tag. Or we could have the platelet inhibitor, and, again, that's not going to show up on the tag because... Again, the platelets are being activated in the TEG sample with by thrombin, which overrides most of those platelet inhibitors. So if you see a normal TEG and patient bleeding, these are a couple things you can think about relative to that. So um, that is pretty much the end of the main part of the presentation. I can do some more examples unless you want to go with Dr. Balad and go with her presentation. We can come back. Do did, some more examples if you wanted to. Did you want to do your, uh, Julie, did you want to do your test? I can do the quiz. I think we should do the, I think we should do the quiz and we can always repeat the quiz. So right. I'd, I'd like to do that and let's see if we can get any of these right. All right. See if I've been paying attention. Okay. Using the tag decision tree, which is right here, which is kind of an algorithm made by Heman, Hemanetics, Heman, um, and such. What is your interpretation of this, uh, the tracing? Select all that apply. Okay, so um, so everybody out there, if you have, if you're watching it, see if you get the answer right, and uh, we're going to give you a few few minutes to look at it before I chime in and see how if I've been paying attention tonight or not. Um, okay. So number one is probably has uh, heparin been reversed. Um, I'm going to say it's normal. Yes, the heparin has been reversed. Oh, okay. So and that's a question you always want to ask. Well, I mean, in this case, you can see because you have the heparinase and the non-heparinase one, um, and they're pretty much the same. So, um, yes, I would say the heparin has been reversed. So other than that. So I'm going to pick normal in this one. Okay. So let's exactly. All parameters are within normal range. So, again, if the patient is bleeding, you know, it's probably a suture deficiency um, or, um, you know, if the patient was on platelets inhibitors. And, again, you get that from the history. So, Yes, All right, I got one go right. Next. Okay, question right. two. Somebody's keeping score, right? <laughs> All right, in this case, it's post-protamine. It's a Kalen with heparinase sample. Patient is uh, status is bleeding. So using the decision tree or just what you learned tonight, um, 
what is the likely interpretation and what uh, types of uh, treatments would you consider? Um, huh. I'm, I'm, oh man. Okay, I'm going to go with, uh, I'm going to go with A, factor deficiency. All right. Select all that apply. So that's the, the, the R value is too long. Right. Um, the, uh. Let's see, I, I can't read that right there. The green one, uh, what's that right there, the green? Uh, it's a little elongated. It's, it's 4.3 with 4 as the upper limit. Okay, so it's a, it's a, that's also a little long. And yep. the angle seems too shallow to me. Yep. Somebody guessed? Hold it. Somebody guessed. Hold Let me see what they, what they what, let me go to the chat. Somebody said, what's the MA? They, they picked... Uh, a, Meerkat Supreme picked A and uh, wants to know what the MA is. Oh, it's 38.8. Well, I agree with, I agree with Meerkat. Oh, no, he said maybe B as well. I'm going to stay firmly on A. I say it's A. All okay. right? All right. Let's see what it is. Oh, it's all three, A, B, and C. I mean, based on the R value, you have a factor deficiency. Um, based on the MA value, you have a platelet deficiency or dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And then C value, you have low fibrinogen levels. So possible treatments for this, likely the patient is bleeding, so you probably want to hit the platelets and FFP. Again, depending on how much they're bleeding, but both platelets and FFP would probably be necessary for this patient to stop bleeding. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have to give that one to Meerkat. He wins that one. I was... I, I just said fact that everything. So I'd have given everything. We'd have given everything anyway. Would have given two two platelets, two right. two platelets, two FFP, and uh, ten pack of cryo. That's what we would have done. Okay. And it would have made sense based on the tags. The tags. But we wouldn't uh, have based it on the tag. We'd have just done, we'd have just done that. We'd have probably done yeah. that for the first one too, even if it was surgical bleeding. <laughs> And then when they continued to bleed, maybe we would have found something. But then they would have hidden it and said it wasn't really bleeding. So let's go to number three. We know that we know the deal. All right. So now we just have the first about ten minutes of the tag. The patient's status is bleeding, um, and it's a kalin with heparinase. Using the tag, um, is the patient likely to require more protamine as a treatment for bleeding at this point in time? Well, I, I would Based say I would say no. That's correct. If the is the patient likely to require FFP, FFP as a treatment for bleeding? Oh, I don't know. Let's see. Let's see if somebody else answers that. Um. The R value, the MA. Um, but we I'm, only see the first part here, so. Yes, I'm, I'm going to say yes. Okay. What's R? Let's see, there's a, somebody's R is asking. R 6.4, so it's 6. more 4? Yep. 6.4, Meerkat, 6.4. Let me type it in. 6.4. So, and the No answers, FFP, he said. Yep, that's correct. No FFP. It, the normal R value suggests that the factor deficiency is not the cause of bleeding at this point in time. Okay, so again, just by starting, you know, you don't have to wait for the whole thing to get done. You can start looking at what, as it goes, to kind of get an idea of what you're going to need if a patient is bleeding. So let's go to the next one. Um, this is... Again, patient is bleeding, paling with heparinase, so it's not a heparin issue. Um, they're in the ICU using the tag. What are the likely causes of bleeding in this patient? Okay. Um. Oh. 
I, I would say, I'm going to say E. That looks like a perfectly normal tracing to me. You know what? It's pretty close to normal. I mean, the R value is just a little bit over the um, the normal range, but you're right. You probably, it probably, I would start looking at surgical bleeding first and then um, see what happens. But, you know, they're going to argue with me about that. I mean, the fact yeah, is... They're going to say, no, 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 no. <laughs> so they might want to give something because they're in the ICU. And, yeah, we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. But, you know, that's that's the thing. But, I mean, at least you have a little bit more information than you did without. So, anyway. So if the plate is... It basically, if the patient is oozing, wait an hour, then repeat tag analysis. If they're bleeding profusely, that's a whole different situation. Sure, so sure. You kind of take it as you, it goes. So, all right. Fifth question. What is the interpretation? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay, so the, the R value is not too bad. The MA is low, just looking yeah. at it. But it's within range. Um, it's, it's within range? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, hmm. Okay. Uh. Uh. Okay. So I'm the gonna, angles. Go ahead. The angle the is, angle? yeah, the angle is narrow, is shallow. Right. So, so that's you. Okay, go ahead. So, so, so it looks like I would say C, and Scott also says C, low that fibrinogen. Is, yes, and that is correct. So yes. cryoprecipitate, um, or if you have it available, the fibrinogen concentrate as a treatment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I need to write that down. I got a question about that, too, I need to ask you. Okay. All right, so mm -hmm. do you want me to go on? Um, no, I think I think okay. that was really good. We could always come back and do a couple of more. I think we'd like to hear from uh, Dr. Valad now. Oksana, Sounds if you're good. ready, I think we're going to now make a switch. I don't know how they do it. But, Julie, that was fantastic, and thank you. Now, you're going to stay with us, right, and then be with us during the, yep. the, uh, the question and answer period that follows yep. this. So mm -hmm. uh, I think we'll switch now to Dr. Valad and... Uh, Oh, I don't think we need a break. I think we're all, is everybody good? Yeah. yeah, I don't think we need a break. Everybody's at home watching this. They can always pause it and take a break. It's like DVR. Yeah. Uh, good evening. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome um, to the um, uh, webinar. It's a pleasure for me to speak in front of you, actually not even seeing you. I give a lot of talks, but this is my first exposure to the webinar like this. Um, uh, when I heard to whom I will be speaking, uh, I realized that this is a great opportunity for me to share with you uh, cases and experience, and I really appreciate uh, you as an uh, important team members uh, during the management of uh, patients uh, in the operating room. I work very closely with our uh, perfusion team. They do run tech in OR, uh, both tech success and tech 5000. So instead of um, now after a wonderful talk that Julie gave, I would like to concentrate on the cases that we um, uh, did uh, and interact and through those cases uh, show you some situations that you have to pay attention to. I will, ho will have no uh, questions afterwards, but I would like to mention about tech evolution at the end, a new uh, assay, which is called uh, tech success. So what for me uh, was amazing about tech that um, in one assay, you can have a snapshot of uh, what's going on with the blood. And oh. if as soon as you recognize the pattern, you can address those issues. And oh. those are mainly the patterns that uh, you can see here, oh, hold on, um, hold on. where Doctor, patient can be uh, hypocoagulable Dr. on uh, coagulation factors, Dr. platelets Ballad. and fibrinogen. Mm. Sorry, yes. Oh, yeah. well, you need to share your screen so we can see your presentation. Oh, am I so, so sorry? Hold That's on, okay. I, I thought... Uh, let me yeah, and if, go into and it. If you could move to your left just an inch, about four inches when you can. 
and Julie okay. to your right. Okay, yeah. I do not see, uh, let me. The little plus sign in the middle of your screen. I do not see the sign. Uh, let me just, uh, hold on. We are trying to figure out here. Yeah. In your Skype window. Skype window. Uh, let me. You'll see a plus for sharing your screen. Uh, we don't see it. Mm -hmm. uh, a plus uh, a share screen. Yes, share screen. Yeah, we hold on. Give us one second. Uh -huh. We're trying to That's locate fine. that on my side. Uh, we don't. Uh, it was here. It may be in the lower left hand corner of your screen. Uh, two little. It looks like two little pieces of paper or something, I guess they're saying. I don't know. I can't see it, so I don't know how to do it. Hold on. Mine, I, it was think, three I think, uh, hold on. I think we. Let's see. Share your screen. <laughs> you gotta love technology. Okay. See. can you can you see there it goes there go. yep you're good oh my god so i was talking all this time without any yes. any screen okay yeah. so so those are the patterns that um i mentioned to you and uh, we're going to concentrate uh, through the cases on several situations that you can see here i would like to first concentrate on the r value values that will be affected by uh, problems with the coagulation factors or uh, anticoagulants and through these cases again i would like to point what can be given or what should not be given uh, in case if it is normal so the first case that i have uh, this, that, that was the case after uh, cardiac surgery Immediately after cardiac surgery, a patient uh, developed an uh, markedly abnormal PTT. Uh, now, uh, preoperatively, her PT and PTT values were completely normal. However, postoperatively, the only values that was affected uh, was PTT. So PTT uh, addressed um, coagulation factors in intrinsic pathway, which is 8, 9, and 11. However, when we did TEC, uh, tech looks completely normal. Julie explained it to you all the parameters. So R was 6.8, normal angle, normal MA. Now, important part to ask um, surgeons how patient is clinically and patient was very stable. So this is the case that before given any additional treatment such as FFP or factor concentrates because we look at the abnormal PTT, uh, the uh, causes of abnormal PTT and normal tech uh, should be addressed. So now me being in a, a coagulation and in the laboratory, I have the advantages of running coagulation assay. However, uh, getting results of coagulation assays can take uh, several hours, sometimes uh, several days. So in this particular case, we, as you can see, we did many uh, uh, assays, several factors, PTT-dependent factors, which were normal. However, patient was positive for lupus anticoagulant. So uh, in this particular case, I'm just going to go back, her abnormal PTT was due to lupus anticoagulant anticoagulant presence. And actually, uh, I follow up this patient for several months. And as you can see, it was up for up to four months and then PTT get back uh, to normal. So this particular patient actually should not be transfused uh, with anything. But this is something to keep in mind that we uh, started to observe after cardiac surgeries, we do a lot of total artificial hearts and LWATs in our institution, and that's what I start uh, to notice. So what is a lupus anticoagulant? So lupus anticoagulant is um, um, the factor that prolongs in vitro clotting by completing with coag factor. So it will prolong PTT. However, in, vi in vivo, uh, it will um, potentially can be easy transient, like it's in this particular patient, or can a patient will develop thrombosis, uh, be part of the antiphospholipid syndrome. And if ASI uh, would remain positive during long period of time, this particular patient would potentially have hypercoagulable state uh, as antiphospholipid syndrome. But again, as you can see, uh, her tech uh, was giving me an idea what uh, next steps I should do and ask, ask uh, uh, surgeons do not give her 
anything until I figure out. And that particular day, I was able to figure out a, a situation within um, several hours. Uh, so let's move to another case. So this particular case is, um, and again, not all the cases I put it from the uh, cardiac surgery, but you can see them in cardiac or other surgery setting, specifically when you are involved in those uh, patient's care. So again, uh, uh, here is a very different situation. Patient had intracranial bleeding, so the clinically patient is bleeding. However, tech the same, it looks very, very normal. Normal R, 5.4, normal angle, and normal MA. So as Julie pointed out in her slides, uh, that um, we cannot detect platelet inhibition by just using a citratic tag. So now this is not to talk about platelet mapping, but just show you that when we did a platelet mapping, so this is a modification of the tag, you can see that patient has a, a significant platelet inhibition. So the, I, I just didn't put both slides, but there was a MA um, inhibition of arachidonic acid and ADP aggregation pathway. She would not, he would not bleed uh, from the just arachidonic acid inhibition uh, significantly. However, if there is a arachidonic and ADP inhibition, yes, that would cause significant bleeding, but that you would not be able to see with just a, a basic tag. So again, this patient, uh, if you see something like that and patient is bleeding, uh, that should be in um, uh, your consideration. And uh, probably if there is no other tools, I would definitely start potentially with a uh, platelet transfusion um, if um, that would be such a case. Uh, so with that, I would like to point out uh, following tag limitations that were um, um, discussed with Julie, but again, I would like to reinforce in the, when we do tag, uh, that involves cup and a pin. However, we do not have endothelium. And the role of one Willebrand factor is to adhere platelets to endothelial surface. So we cannot assess uh, von Willebrand factor um, activity in the tag. So if patient is bleeding, uh, that should be another consideration um, uh, or, or that patient may have a von Willebrand disease. Now, a uh, patient usually would have history of von Willebrand disease. However, in situation like ECMO and Impella, I will share with you this those cases later, this is something that we start to notice and a lot of literature showed this uh, reports that you have a von Willebrand factor degradation. Now, as Julie mentioned, uh, anatomic cause of bleeding should be considered. And uh, as I showed you in this particular case, platelet receptor inhibition is uh, due to renal failure, antiplatelet drugs, or sometimes uh, supplements like if patient takes aspirin plus fish oil, plus turmeric, and uh, that can cause uh, bleeding in co um, uh, altogether. So uh, let's move to the third case. I was discussing um, problems with the R when um, R is normal, but patient is, is uh, hemostatic or bleeding. Now uh, let's look at the case where R is very short. Tech looks normal, but it's not quite normal because R is very short. It took 1.9 minutes to form, to start to form a clot. So this case happened immediately after renal transplant. Patient was clotting intraoperatively and um, transplant was aborted. Uh, tech was done at, at that time. And when I saw that, uh, my next workup was to assess hypercoagulability coagulation factors based uh, hypercoagulability. There was not too much issue with the platelet hypercoagulability because MA was very normal. So again, um, in this particular case, it took us uh, probably uh, more than one week to get all the results together. And out of all the results, you can see that patient had anti-cardiolipin antibodies, which were in a very high titer and persistent, meaning in the view of thrombosis, patient had antiphospholipid syndrome. Uh, she had uh, inherited uh, uh, mutation 
she was uh, positive for prothrombin 2 gene mutation, another hypercoagulable risk factor. In addition, not only her clot was formed, however, there was a plasminogen activator inhibitor. Plasminogen activator inhibitor uh, basically uh, affects fibrinolysis. So high level of plasminogen activated inhibitor would inhibit fibrinolysis. So this particular patient was clotting intraoperatively due to multifactorial uh, thrombophilia. The, and again, uh, the idea of what to do was based on the tech when I saw that R was very short. So not only, again, there is enormous information Information that we can obtain with the tech um, using a knowledge uh, in coagulation. And that's why I think it's important for me to share with you this type of cases because you are basically a first line that would recognize this type of cases and bring to attention all the anesthesiologists, surgeons, or the two um, pathologists that can work with you further to determine what's happening. All right, so let's move to the other case. So this case is very different. This particular patient was a, a liver transplant. So this was done just uh, preoperatively, just before patient was planning to be uh, uh, get ready for the liver transplant. Now, this is anticipated normal tech tracing, and you can see that this particular patient has a prolonged R, very low fibrinogen uh, angle and MA, which uh, uh, indicates fibrinogen level, and very low MA. Now, we know that in end-stage liver disease, patient um, uh, is not producing uh, adequate amount of factors, but if patient is stable, both anticoagulant and procoagulant factors are not uh, made, so that makes patient more or less balanced and hemostatic. Now, this case for me was much more worse uh, than that. That uh, my uh, suspicion in this particular case was if there is a potential for consumptive coagulopathy on top of the end-stage liver disease. So in order again to for me to confirm this uh, as you can see pt and ptt were markedly abnormal uh, I, uh, for coagulation factors i do not use inr i use usually pt uh, fibrinogen was very very low as almost undetectable here however uh, i order upfront factor eight so what's the difference between all other factors and uh, factor eight, uh, factors are made in the liver. Factor eight is made in endothelial cells. So if there is a liver, just liver disease coagulopathy, all the factors will be low except factor eight. Usually it will be either normal or high. Now in this particular case with a low factor eight, that indicates for me consumptive coagulopathy because all everything consumed, including uh, factor eight. So this particular patient was was um, actually when then I first discussed case with a surgeon was septic and probably was in consumptive coagulopathy stage DIC. Um, that's before anything can be transplanted to him, he should be uh, basically resuscitated with the coagulation factors um, uh, as FFP with the cryo and platelets. Now in the setting of DIC, uh, Current literature would not suggest uh, uh, NOVA 7 or prothrombin complex concentrates because those are activated factors and can precipitate thrombosis. So truly um, a very difficult case. A uh, patient was stabilized and then eventually uh, transplanted with the liver uh, without further uh, complications. All right, uh, as you can see, cases will, can be very difficult and very challenging uh, that uh, you work with. And uh, again, this is one of the example. All right, so let's look at uh, this case. So um, uh, in our institution, as I mentioned to you, uh, we perform uh, tech in the laboratory as well as tech is performed in the OR setting. So um, again, uh, before you interpret any tag or any tracing, patient's history is essential. So here we have a stable patient, immediately postoperatively they did a tag, and as you can see, uh, tag was run for 101 minutes, and there is still no split. So then the case was it's one hour and a half, yes? So that the case was brought uh, to my attention. So looking at the patient history, uh, my first question was, uh, did you add calcium? 
yes. Uh, and uh, as before uh, uh, advocating anything I said, we need to repeat tag on a uh, fresh specimen. And as you can see, drastic difference, 3.8 minutes versus one hour and a half. So this particular case shows you that uh, just because calcium was not added, and Julie mentioned to you that uh, calcium is essential, and when we collect uh, blood in, into saturated tube, uh, we remove calcium effects. So if we do not add calcium, we will end up with a picture like this. So again, because you as perfusion team, I don't know how you perform, if you will uh, perform a tech in your institution in OR, uh, it has to be, uh, attention has to be uh, placed uh, to put all the necessary components into the cup uh, to uh, have this uh, uh, reaction that as expected. All right, so um, I finished uh, with the R cases and I would like now to uh, put uh, everyone's attention a little bit to the fibrinolysis. Uh, this is something that with uh, a conventional assays, even in a specialized laboratory as we have um, in our institution uh, and many other laboratories, we would not run uh, assays to assess fibrinolysis. The beauty of the tag that uh, shows us potentially fibrinolysis that can be a pathologic. Uh, usually when clot forms, Oh, the, uh, eventually it should be dissolved by our own fibrinolytic system. However, if we can see fibrinolysis um, uh, 30 minutes after MA is formed, that is pathologic fibrinolysis. Now, there is the two types of fibrinolysis that we can see by tag. Uh, the first one um, is called primary fibrinolysis. This is type of fibrinolysis that can be due to excess of plasminogen or tissue plasminogen activator. And there is also a secondary so-called fibrinolysis that um, you can see tracings are very, very different. The first tracing clot is not uh, able to form and is immediately lies. We call it so-called teardrop. In the second uh, case, uh, a patient is very hypercoagulable compared to normal tag and then clot starts to lie. So this is a case of potentially septic patient when coagulation uh, cascade is activated and then a uh, fibrinolytic system would also start uh, to be activated and start to break a clot. So this is a secondary fibrinolysis and usually we can see it in the first stage of DAC. When that stage is passed so the, and patient go into the second stage as I showed you pre prior to that with the liver coagulopathy, that's what we see. That's, uh, that's the case where you have second stage and uh, consumptive, full-blown consumptive uh, 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 coagulopathy. So let's look at some cases. This is one of our case uh, of patient with a total artificial heart. On day 12, um, patient was, um, uh, as expected, when you have a new device, hypercoagulable, she was carefully placed on anticoagulation therapy, but very minimal anticoagulation, still hypercoagulable. Uh, however, uh, two days uh, and her coax were uh, high platelets, high fibrinogen, she had leukocytosis, so my interpretation of that particular tag was uh, combined hypercoagulability, coagulation factors, and fibrinogen and platelets. Uh, fibrinogen is coagulation factors, and but however, thrombin generation was very strong, yes. And two days later, uh, I saw this type of tracing. As you can see, clot, uh, again, patient was hypercoagulable, and then clot started to break. Now, this is what it was so-called uh, secondary fibrinolysis. So, based on... Uh, this tracing, for me, this is, was something pathologic, and I was reaching out to the surgeons and the team that per this particular tracing, patient will be at risk of bleeding, not because she has a factor deficiency, but because of increased uh, fibrinolytic activity. And indeed, uh, patient did have a bleeding problem later that day, which we would be able to see several hours prior uh, to it happen. Uh, what happened, patient did 
have also infection which was discovered and patient was treated appropriately and um, uh, everything was resolved. But again, this is example of secondary fibrinolysis and you can see things happen very dramatically within uh, one or two uh, days. Uh, now, this case, next case, it's a very different. Uh, the, the teardrops that I explained it to you, uh, the case uh, was a bleeding trauma patient. Uh, and uh, in this particular case, the fibrinolysis is 62% uh, the clot immediately cannot even be formed. The moment it starts to form, it's lysed. Um, uh, the difference between, uh, let me just go back to the uh, first case. So difference in this particular case, the treatment would be uh, potentially to consider uh, giving a heparin uh, to slow down thrombin generation and continue with anticoagulation before it would go into the second stage of um, DAC potentially and give uh, antibiotics to treat an infection. Versus this case, the issue is a uh, clot is not stable and um, antifibrinolytic agent not actually factors replacement of platelets, antifibrinolytic agents would be a treatment of choice. So if it is not trauma setting, which type of setting we would see this particular patient? So when patient is in cardiopulmonary bypass, that would you potentially be able to see because of increased uh, TPA. Uh, also uh, in the setting of the uh, liver disease, uh, uh, a liver transplant when a new donor liver is implanted and there is a perfusion um, of the donor liver with the uh, patient's blood. So that's a situation that you can see uh, primary fibrinolysis and uh, possibly uh, consider, again, antifibrinolytic uh, therapy instead. And again, in the liver disease, you also wanted to be careful with antifibrinolytic therapy, but uh, this is the treatment of choice uh, in situations uh, like that. Uh, so again, diagnosis would be uh, primary fibrinolysis. Now, so this is third type of fibrinolysis. So let's look at this particular tag. Um, the, uh, it was brought to my attention again. Uh, I caught that this was MCS patient uh, who um, was uh, again stable, no issues, no bleeding, not really clotting at that point of time when we evaluate patient. However, fibrinolysis was 7.5%. Uh, now, more and more literature saying that really 8% is not quite normal, even uh, in trauma patients when we have uh, more than 3% fibrinolysis, that should be addressed. So, a concern was from the team what this means, 7.5% fibrinolysis. Now, if I look at this tag, uh, it looks very normal, but there is suddenly this very minute dip. And for me, this is not quite real. Now, I did interpret over 7,000 tags by 8,000 tags by now, I think. So for me, it's uh, more as an artifact. But yes, I would give, um, um, yes, this is very subtle. But for me, that was not real. And I did ask um, a team to repeat tag. You see, this is the same patient repeated tag and tag is completely normal. So this particular patient should not be treated with anything. Again, history, you sh should rely on the history. So if stable patient, despite something that you may see, uh, you should not just treat uh, even tag results. If something is uh, doesn't make a sense, uh, the, uh, at least uh, tag can be repeated. All right. So I think I have a few more cases. Uh, um, now, when you have such a uh, waste knowledge of text through Julie and my cases. I would like to share with you some complex cases. I have two complex cases that um, uh, I would like to show you, and this is something that uh, uh, I, I have this type of question very commonly from perfusion team. And again, it's a trauma patient, but it's a patient on ECMO. So the case was brought to my attention because patient had a subtherapeutic ACT and was bleeding. Uh, now I advised them to do a tag and take it from there. So here's the tag. Uh, the straight black line, this is a CK, uh, was run for 72 minutes. Normal value is between five to 10 minutes and we eventually stopped it because there was no clot formation. However, 
when we did heparinase cup, uh, the CK green tracings, you can see that uh, essentially it was normal. So that was telling me that despite subtherapeutic ACT, patient had a significant heparin uh, effect. Now, because they relied on ACT, the uh, dose of heparin was even more increased. So uh, then I had... Um, uh, work to do and um, um, see what else potentially was there that was uh, predisposing patient to uh, bleeding. Now, in addition, so as they increased dose of the heparin, PTT became even more prolonged. So PTT was more than 200 seconds. Heparin uh, level was therapeutic level for the full dose of heparin between 0 0.3 to 0 0.7. In this particular patient, it was supra-therapeutic 1.34, almost double of normal. This is what exactly reflected by the uh, tag tracing. And uh, in addition, uh, the, uh, we did a platelet mapping. There was a platelet inhibition, both arachidonic acid and ADP um, a pathway. So again, there was a significant platelet inhibition. Patient was thrombocytopenic. It's interesting. Let, let's uh, you see. Uh, Julie mentioned to you, we when we do a tag, we see potential of blood to clot. So if we look at this attack potential uh, platelets, even 64,000, uh, there, there was a great potential for them to aggregate, but that they were inhibited. In addition, uh, we uh, send uh, the assay, which is high molecular weight multimers. There was significant loss of von Willebrand factor multimers. Now, to get all these results took me more than two weeks because multimers results take more than 10 days when we send out this test. However, uh, so that was in summary why patient was bleeding, but already even without it, tech was showing me that there was a significant um, heparin effect. Uh, now, um, this is an, uh, a case is similar to this, prompted uh, our internal study to look at the short-term devices like ECMO and Impella and look at the multimers loss in those devices. And we noticed that there is a significant loss um, in the patients on short-term devices the moment they are placed and there is a, a rapid recovery the moment uh, they are remote and it's even worse than pa in a patient with a heart made and hardware. Total artificial heart, they are not that much affected or not affected at all. However, uh, short-term devices, ECMO and Pella separate or together uh, lead to a significant loss. Now, uh, at this moment when we, we send so many tests, I would not even send it right now uh, uh, by the by default, for me, if patient is on the that type of device, they will have um, a, a, a Willebrand factor multimers loss, and again, that would uh, uh, contribute to additional bleeding. Uh, now, so uh, this is, I think, my last case, um, and uh, um, again, this is a patient with a device. Again, this is a, a case from the MCS mechanical circulatory support, and those are the cases that manage between perfusion and ICU team because those are patients in, uh, immediately post-op in ICU settings. So this particular patient had a total artificial heart and then developed post-operative thromboembolic stroke while patient was on continuous heparin IV infusion. So we do uh, monitor te uh, um, MCS devices anticoagulation with the tag. So in this particular case, um, I do not see any difference between a black tracing, a CK tracing, and the green tracing, which is heparinase uh, tracing. So that was telling me that per tag, there is no heparin effect. Now, what can uh, be it due to? So again, we know that uh, heparin effect um, affects uh, potentiates effect of antithrombin by thousand times. And if there is an antithrombin uh, deficiency, the heparin has no way to act uh, appropriately. So that's the reason why uh, to work up this particular patient, I did, we did PTT, uh, we did heparin level, and we did measure antithrombin level. So normal level for antithrombin between 80 to 120% in our laboratory, 
this particular patient had a 58% uh, antithrombin activity. So even so, heparin was given, and you know, in MCS patients, you don't start with a high dose of heparin. Uh, you start a slow uh, patient, the heparin was not effective. So this particular patient most likely developed uh, had heparin resistance due to antithrombin 3 deficiency, and that was particularly leading to his uh, thromboembolic stroke. And this is what we do see in the patients within first uh, two weeks after implantation of the device implantation. Now, um, uh, the antithrombin deficiency, again, uh, sig is significantly in will increase the risk of thrombosis, a uh, first thing. And the second, as I said, it will uh, lead to heparin resistance. Now, because heparin assays that we use to monitor uh, a, a heparin uses patient's antithrombin, this assay will also uh, not be able to measure a heparin level that is given to the patient. Okay, uh, so um, just to... Um, Based on all these cases that I presented to you, I would like to uh, you to point that there is a differences between PTT, ACT, and heparin assays versus viscoelastic assays like a, a TAG or Rotem. So PTT and unfractionated heparin level, we use uh, plasma, so we remove all the other cellular components. And uh, PTT will be affected by lupus anticoagulant. Will be, it will prolong PTT. Factor deficiency will prolong PTT. If tube is not filled correctly, there will be high anticoagulant um, um, to uh, blood volume ratio will prolong uh, a PTT and antithrombin deficiency also can affect measurements of the uh, heparin. Uh, in the heparin assay, uh, we measure it's much more reliable, but if patient has antithrombin deficiency, assay will be affected. Now, between ACT and viscoelastic, both are done on a, a whole blood, but more and more I can see uh, issues with uh, ACT. Now, you have to pay attention that ACT para uh, parameters and values are device-specific, and even if you have several devices in your institution, um, the values should not be uh, uh, the same across different devices. And I did show you effect of the um, uh, TAG and Rotem and uh, physiologic effect of the unfractionated heparin on no effect uh, using those viscoelastic assays. So uh, with this in summary, I do believe that tech is a very useful tool for initial assessment of coagulopathies. It can guide appropriate diagnostic workup and patient management. It can target your workup, yes. In complex cases, it, again, it should not be used alone, but it can guide diagnosis and treatment. It does require uh, experienced technologists or perfusionists to perform assay and requires expertise in coagulation for interpretation. As I mentioned to you, in our institution, I do work very closely with the perfusion team. We provide uh, a lot of training for the team, and anytime when they have a questions, uh, they know that they can reach me on my cell phone, and I will immediately, uh, if I am um, uh, not out of the country, sometimes when even I'm out of the country, I would respond uh, and discuss uh, cases with uh, with the team. I uh, have a few more minutes, um, uh, and uh, I would just uh, two, three slides I would like to mention about um, tech evolution. Uh, now, as uh, much as I rely myself on the tech 5000, and we can perform on uh, this uh, uh, device, basic tech, heparinase tech, uh, rapid tech and platelet mapping. Uh, as through the cases that I did show you, it requires uh, uh, knowledge how to perform assay. You need to make sure that QC are run every eight hours uh, for the TAG 5000, that all reagents are mixed correctly, and a cup is uh, fixed correctly. Otherwise, you will see, uh, again, another fibrinolysis potentially. Uh, the, in 2016, uh, TAG 6 test was launched. So uh, instead of cup and pin, there is a sonic way that is converted to graph, and uh, reagents are already pre-measured and built in those type of cartridges. So uh, you looking uh, at both devices, I still use uh, both devices in our institution.
institutions, but I do believe that there is a still and will be utility for Tech 5000. I don't think I will at this point um, will eliminate this because I rely a lot on it. However, if we start to use Tech Success specifically in OR setting and assays that has to be performed by perfusion team. So uh, what is there in those cartridges? Um, you can see that cartridges have, uh, uh, there is a four channels. Uh, they would, uh, the first channel would measure CK basic as we have. One disadvantage is that I do not really like at this time, there is no fibrinolysis. And I do believe that fibrinolysis is necessary. However, to my knowledge, a uh, company is addressing that matter and they are working on that type of cartridge, but at this time, uh, fibrinolysis is parameter is not available. There is a rapid tag uh, which gives you as MA value for a platelet function. There is a heparinase um, tag where we look at the difference between two R values, and there is a functional fibrinogen, two parameters that uh, roughly coral MA and uh, value for fibrinogen, this value is roughly correlates with the Klaus method of fibrinogen based on a literature and our internal studies that we did over 300 patients in my institution. Uh, so it is easy to perform. It will improve. Um, they have very uh, uh, good uh, tech manager software that allows uh, everybody in, in hospital anytime to uh, get to the any computer, to the cell phone, and uh, uh, potentially uh, see live tracings as they run. So tech can be run either in OR or laboratory, but the tracing can be seen by everybody who are managing particular patient uh, uh, with the easy access to the results and the QCs are not needed as it is uh, necessary for 5000s. As I mentioned, there is a no uh, lysis parameter and at this uh, at this time, plated mapping is only available with ADP cartridge, uh, not arachidonic acid. So we do not use in our institution tech success for plated mapping. We use for OR liver um, uh, cardiac ORs. Uh, however, uh, I will be looking forward to see to new developments of the tech. And I do think this is it for my talk. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Wow. Okay, so, um, and now, Dr. Vallad, if you can go to uh, a close out your screen share. Yeah, I did, I think. I think. Yeah, there you go, perfect. <laughs> okay, so now I'm cut in half, and uh, I know they're going to fix that, and Julie, you're a little bit in half, and so if Julie would move to your left a little bit, Dr. Vallad, just an inch to your left just a little bit, and okay. uh, that's perfect. Well, okay, okay. <laughs> that's perfect. Don't go too far, just an inch. Yeah, great. Okay, that looks okay. good. Okay, so... Both of you, Dr. Wagner and Dr. Vallad, you have both really just blown my mind because this, you know, this is one of the things that concerns me. And I know my, the, the, uh, the uh, tech guys are saying that they really want to take a, a, a short break because they want to do something with the polls that we have up, so I need to tell people that. But, but I've just got to get this thought out of my head, and I've got a lot of questions. I've got many people have left, uh, have asked several questions, but this is really, really complex. This is not just, you know, a POC blood gas analyzer or um, H and H or whatever. Uh, these are really I mean, if it's normal, it's normal. The patient's not bleeding, it is normal. I'd feel comfortable. But just from both of you describing all of the possibilities, I don't, I don't think I have the, I don't have the expertise, the qualifications, uh, the, 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 the knowledge that I would feel very uncomfortable looking at a graph of a bleeding patient and making any kind of decision about what to do without one of you on you know one of either Dr. Wagner or Dr. Vallad telling me what it is I'm seeing there's just no way so if you would forgive me I know the the guys really want me to take a short break we'll come back and and I'll ask all these questions but I need to tell people on YouTube that if you look in the window it's over it's over my left shoulder um, the furthest left top part or right part of the screen, I guess, 
is an I. You click that to answer the polls. And on Facebook, you'll be putting the polls up individually and you just look for the, what looks like a purple graph. It looks like a graph and go on that. And we're just gonna take a short five minute break and then come back and look at those poll questions and then we'll go over all of these questions and any further commentary. So if you give us five minutes, we'll, all, we'll be right back. Thank you. Hey, John. Yeah. You got this urgent letter from the ABCP. Oh, wow. I wonder what this could be. To Joe Basha from the ABCP. Wow, this looks official. Dear Certified Clinical Perfusionist, the American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion is advising you that you must submit 10 Category 1 CEU by next week or you will lose your certification. Sincerely, Dave Matthews, PhD, Roger Ramirez, PhD, and the Executive Co-Directors. Let me call my immediate supervisor, Stephanie, and ask her if I can go. This is perfect. Hello? Yes, Stephanie. Hi, this is Joe. Hi, Joe. Stephanie, I just got an urgent letter from the ABCP stating that I am 10 CEU short and I've been looking at this New Orleans conference and I'd like to submit my request to go to that because I really need the credits. Uh, geez, Joe, uh, I'm sorry I'm not gonna be able to help you. Administration informed me they're denying all meeting requests. I guess you're gonna have to find another way to get your seizures. Oh my what God. Uh, there's nothing I can do. You're on your own, Joe, sorry. I'm taking this up the chain of command. Come in. Dr. McGilvery. Hey, Joe. I don't, <laughs> thank you for seeing me. I don't know what I'm gonna do. I do not have enough CEUs to maintain my certification. Joe, how's that my problem? Our role is to pay you to do perfusion, not to pay you to go take courses. And it was that way in the past, but we just don't have the money to do it anymore. So you're going to have to figure it out on your own. Joe, what's up? Dr. Lumsden, I do not have enough CEUs to maintain my certification, and I'm going to lose my certification. If you take all the perfusionists away, we can't do any cases. We don't have enough perfusionists. I don't care about these CEUs. It costs too much money. you got to stay here and do these cases. Figure out some other way you're going to get education. Hey, Joe, you received another uh, urgent letter from the ABCP. Oh, thank you. Dear Certified Clinical Perfusionist, the American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion regrets to inform you that because you lack enough Category 1 CEU, your certification is suspended. You are no longer a Certified Clinical Perfusionist. Oh, no. Hmm. I really want to go to this meeting. Hey, Joe. You received a letter from your job, man. Hey, dude. Thank you so much. Dear Joe Basha, the Health and Happiness Hospital regrets to inform you that because you lost your ABCP certification to a, due to a lack of Category 1 CEUs, you are fired. You must report immediately to the operating room and clean out your locker to make room for your replacement who clearly knew more than you about getting CEUs and maintaining their certification.
Welcome back. Okay, and uh, we've got Jeff here. I think we've got a, uh, I think we can pan out a little bit. So now we finally get you, we're gonna get you actually involved in this, Jeff. Um, okay, so during the break, and where's, uh, where's, our, where's our panel? Where's our, where's our, sp our faculty? There they are. Julie, yeah. hey, you're back, okay. See, Julie's cut off again. Oh, no, no, I'm here. Who's dealing with Julie? Julie, you gotta Julie? go left. We got everybody. Julie, can you hear us? I don't think so. Julie? Julie, somebody? Julie's just looking. Mm -hmm. no, she's here. Oh, hold on. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing it, I'm doing. Hey, Julie, we can't hear you. Uh, she's off Skype. No, no, I we see her, Jules. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, you're on my speakerphone, but I need you to. What does she need to do? Somebody help me. So first thing, Julie, move left a little bit. We can't hear you on your. Like, did you mute something? No, I've been using my phone. Oh, I can't hear you on the phone. She's on the line, hun. She's she's right here. There. Now try talking. Still nothing. Hold on, let me put it off. How about now? All right, still trying. Okay. Well, hold on. Mm -hmm. You don't have to duck. Just, just, she's on the phone. Okay, try talking. No, we Hello? can't. No. It's on hold. Here, hold on. There you go. No, I don't have that kind of thing. I'm no. Turn off my phone. Okay. No, I'm not on the wrong phone. This is, she's on the phone. She's right here. Can you hear me? No, Jules, I got to call you on this line here. Hold on. This is painful, guys. I'm calling you on another line. Okay. There, it's working now. I hear it. It's ringing. Okay. Okay, there you are. Okay, I'm here too. Okay, good. <laughs> oh, somebody pull this thing really tight for me. Okay, so I think we're good. All right, now we've got it figured out. So I was making the comment, and I know we have these uh, with these polls. We'll look at them here in just a few minutes. But um, they're so rudimentary compared to this. But you know, I'd like to see Jeff in this involved in this picture if we can, because. Um, He's, uh, uh, I was standing there saying, this blew my mind. Between you, uh, Julie, and Oxna, Oxana, I'm sorry, I was absolutely exhausted. And he's shaking his head, no, no, it's not that hard, it's not that hard. I, I, don't, I don't agree. Jeff, you, you, can you at least talk about that? And can we please put Jeff on the screen? Okay, uh, first of all, great presentations from both of you. I think that was a lot of information. And I, I guess the question that might help Joe with this, as far as understanding TEG a little bit better, and, and both of you has successful TEG programs at your hospitals, what resources do you have for a perfusionist uh, there at your hospital to help them understand the interpretation of the results? What's going on, guys? She Somebody can't hear us. Julie, can you hear us? I can hear you. No, I also cannot hear. Okay. No. You have your microphone on? It is? Okay. His microphone is on, guys, but they didn't hear the question. Uh, okay. So can you hear me okay. now? Yeah. No, yeah. that's good. Okay. Uh, first of all, presentations were great. Uh, that was a lot of information, I think, for everybody. And Joe mentioned, you know, it was might be challenging a little bit for somebody getting into TEG to understand the interpretation of the results. Um, both of you have very successful TEG programs at your hospitals. What resources do you have to help perfusionists understand the interpretation part of this? Uh, this is a question for us? Yes, so uh, I oh, mean, okay. what resources do you utilize at your hospitals that some okay. other facilities may be able to use? 
Okay, so let me, uh, maybe I start you if that's okay. Uh, in our institution, I think one of the greatest uh, role that hemonetics played uh, in our institution was providing a, a continuous education and during installation process and um, uh, uh, continuous refreshment. Uh, I had representatives coming uh, to our institution, working with the nurses, working with perfusionists, working with every team member, with the residents, fellows, anesthesiologists. So one of the strengths, I believe, uh, that was given uh, uh, by hemonetics to our institution and I hope to all others was a strong uh, team of support. So even myself, I didn't understood tech right away. Yes, even with my knowledge in coagulation, it took a while till I grab all that knowledge. However, uh, working with them together was a very smooth transition. And again, yes, it may look complex, but as I show you, there is a technically nine or 10 patterns. 99% uh, of the cases will be something that everyone can recognize after initial training. And then, uh, yes, there will be some difficult cases, then uh, expertise it will be required, which we showed through our cases. Uh, however, I do believe that it is not as difficult as it looks, and it's very visual. Now, I, I, uh, I we do work um, on some uh, sort of tutorial and materials that can help perfusionists and everybody who interprets TAG um, in the future. But uh, yes, there, there are resources that are provided. And again, uh, I do believe that, uh, again, based on our experience, you need to have a dedicated perfusion team that would be willing to work uh, together with the laboratory and uh, then it will have a success program will have a success if laboratory is not willing to participate or perfusion team is not willing to participate it will fall apart but in our institution i do believe even um, our perfusionist initially came to me and said uh, 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 we have an issue, how we should work on it. We have a lot of um, blood product utilizations in OR. Uh, we have this type of device, what can be done? And this is how we start our journey that it's last till now and we work together. Mm -hmm. And Julie, what's your, what's your thoughts on that? Because I, I moved close to, to Scott because we were having issues with the cameras here or to, to Jeff, yeah, Scott. Well, Scott's here asking something, but to Jeff here. Um, so we're we're getting we're going to get very close here. So Julie, give me your your impression of that. And 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 Dr. Balad, that was a I thought that was a very thoughtful, very well thought out, you know, uh, 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 set of of um, ideas regarding how we manage this from a clinical perspective. Because perfusionists are just simply not pathologists that are experts in coagulation. Julie, you work. Yeah, of course, you've spent a lot of time around perfusion, and you know this device very well. You've been working on this device for years and years, as long as I've known you. How do you feel about what Dr. Villaj just said? Um, exactly. The, it, it requires a, a level of uh, education and continuing education, not being scared to get in there and make some mistakes and, and get the experience. And once the experience comes, then it just, all seems to kind of flow right into place. Um, at least that's been my experience is that once they get a little experience, a little competence in looking at what and seeing what they have. And remember, it's not just perfusionists that are making the calls. It's the anesthesiologists and the surgeons that also uh, are helping with the interpretation because they can see the patient. They know what's going on with the patient where the perfusionist um, can just help with the, oh, the R is long. Yeah. And then that can, you know, things like that. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's all patience and experience with it. Well, those are, those, are, those are good thoughts. And I love you, Jeff. I do. But I've got to tell you all, okay, and I hear you. And I know you're really, you're trying to rehabilitate this. But uh, th there's, not a, there's not a surgeon or an anesthesiologist that I know that could take some of those examples, especially those patients on ECMO, and determine all of those very unique and odd derangements. And just knowing that those potential derangements exist. So the patient's on heparin, they have plenty of heparin. You know, we all sort of AT3, you know, there's some basic stuff that we do, but 
But I got to tell you, it's going to take a lot of, that's going to be one heck of an in-service before I feel comfortable. Uh, Dr. Vallad and Julie, uh, <laughs> Dr. Wagner, you guys can please be expected. We start using that tag as a POC in the operating room. Your guy's phone's going to blow up because I'm sending you every graph because I don't know what the hell it is. Um, and I think most of my, most of my colleagues may feel the same, but um, so Meerkat tells me that we are starting with TAG right now. It's limited only to cardiac or until we gain experience. And I guess the lysis is the, uh, the fibrinolysis on the, uh, I guess you were talking about the TAG-6 uh, program. Success. Success is available in Canada, according to this person. And uh, Vicky wants to know if TAG will identify hypocalcemia and also if it will uh what your what your view of ddavp is so uh and then also should platelet mapping always be done so there's three kind of questions i'll throw out there and you guys can split them up amongst yourselves uh, well i will take the hypocalcium no it can't i mean that you know you have a blood gas that can tell you whether or not a patient has sufficient calcium. So that's what I would use mm -hmm. um, for that. Um, for the platelet mapping, it all depends on your patient. If the pa all your patients are on uh, platelet inhibitors and they're bleeding postoperatively, yeah, you probably need to run platelet mapping. Mm -hmm. But if they're not, then you probably don't. Okay. So, you know, it's, yeah. So Julie, on that front, total calcium or ionized calcium? Um, ionized, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's been a while. Come on. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it's, you know, calcium, yeah. So just total calcium, just, and, and really yeah. it's not going to hurt to give some anyway, but I know that one, that one no, example. No, it's not. The problem is when you don't have enough. Mm -hmm. And so giving extra is not going to do anything to the patient, but not having enough definitely is going to be a compromise to, uh, coagulopathy or coagulation, so. Sure. Uh, Dr. Vallad on uh, DDAVP, what's your thoughts? Uh, so again, it depends on situation. Uh, for cases like ECMO and uh, uh, Impella and uh, VAD patients, uh, it's a due to mechanical degradation of the multimer. So uh, the role of the DDAVP is to release von Willebrand factor from endothelial cells. So a factor will be um, right away um, uh, degraded, yeah, so there may be not such a utility in DDAVP. And there is a, um, first of all, con some contraindication when there is a congestive failure, heart failure, uh, maybe DDAVP may not be that indicated. And there is a tachyphylaxis because it only can release as much as one Wilbrun factor as it's stored immediately in the telial cells. But if uh, in other situations, yes, potentially preoperatively, yes, it can be given. Once you either remove device or a transport patient with the heart, the issue will be solved by uh, with the um, removing device. Okay, very good. Um, so another good question is, is there a way to determine how much protamine is needed based upon the CK, CKH difference? Offhand, I don't think there is a formula for that. Specifically, so I don't. Um, I would have to think. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so maybe we uh, can find that out. Uh yeah, I think probably I would myself have to, because the pharmacy has a specific, uh, based on the heparin dose given, has the dose that a protamine is given, yes. Mm -hmm. However, if about per tech, you potentially can see if R is normalizing. Uh, I think the more issue would come if patient is obese or uh, having edema, the, uh, after the surgery, it, we can have rebound heparin effect. So, uh, if let's say protamine was given, tag looks normalized, and patient started to bleed, I would repeat tag because it can be not due to coagulopathy, but again 
for heparin rebound from the storage sites. So that's another dose um, can be given, but you have to be careful because when heparin, uh, when protamine too much is given, it also can cause a bleeding uh, reversal uh, of the effect. So uh, again, there is not such a magic number per tag. It's more clinically and per pharmacy, usually that uh, uh, is those given uh, to, to the patients. Mm -hmm. Now I had another, I have a, my own question and that is how does TAG identify, um, oh, I, I guess I would be, you know, I guess I know the answer to this, but I've got, I'm just going to ask it. How does TAG deal with the novel anticoagulants that exist like Eliquis, the, the, the DTIs and the factor 10A inhibitors in terms of what you see with those? And of course I have a, a, a real interest in you know, we're going to see more of these patients and how do we treat that? You know, okay, so we, we know what it is, but of course there's no antidote to these things. So I've sort of uh, been wondering yeah, about so, that. Uh, so sorry, if Julie, it's okay, I start uh, and uh, she will uh, complete. The reason I, I, I would like to uh, discuss this question because I've been looking at that myself personally in our setting. So first of all, a tag is activated with a kaolin. So what we assess more PTT pathway, new drugs as a rivaroxaban, a pixaban, and the bigatron, they act slightly different. So if we are talking about the bigatron with the kaolin activator, yes, we can see effect, we can see supratherapeutic effect. However, when we are talking about rivaroxaban and a pixaban, uh, in the United States, there is more tendency to use 10A inhibitors versus the Bigatron, which is two, uh, two uh, factor two inhibitors, uh, those are more uh, P PT sensitive, and usually uh, with the current reagent, uh, the tag will look normal. So, how in a laboratory or in a hospital setting, and this time we deal with those issues. Uh, let's say a patient would come to an emergency department unconscious, and potentially there is a drug. If there is no um, apixaban or rivaroxaban assay in the hospital, if you do heparin assay, unfractionate heparin assay, and assay is positive, it tells you the drug is present. However, tag with the current CK tracing is not sensitive. And the, uh, there are several publications using different reagents, but it's not yet in the process or approved. So at this time, I would say for the bigotron, yes. For apixaban, rivaroxaban, no. And I would let Julie to, again, she has a lot of expertise in that ma in the tech matters. So, Julie? No, I agree with her. I mean, she probably has more experience now with the newer drugs. So um, my gut feeling would be that you're not going to see it as well as heparin. Heparin is great because we have heparinase, but the other ones you're not going to see as well. So it's, you know, one of those things that, you know, you, and, uh, you don't let know. Me just ask yeah, so there is a uh, there is a antidotes for both the bigatron and 10A inhibitors, and those antidotes are extremely expensive. It runs between 30 to 50 thousand per dose. Ooh. So this is becoming a major issue for hospitals to give the antidote or not to give. That's why I'm very heavily involved in this type of um, uh, testing. Yeah, I was I was looking for tag as an option. So this is maybe a voice of the customers to the hemonetics team that they need to. Add address it as soon as possible. Yeah, that's that's very good. I'm glad you brought that up because uh, I, I'm wondering, what is your view on um, CVVH, high volume CVVH, with, not with dialysis, but with convective therapy in terms of being able to remove any of these devices? Do you have any experience with that or thoughts on that? Uh, the Bigatron. The bigotron can be removed through the dialysis, but not uh, that much apixaban and rivaroxaban. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Jeff, did you have any? Uh, you have any questions for these guys? I'm, 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 I'm telling you right now. I need a drink after this. This is, this was, this was really intense. I mean, this, this was intense lectures and uh, uh, a very complex issue. But, you know. What are your thoughts? You have any questions for the panel, or any, uh, any thought, any thoughts for me? I thought it was uh, a good overall presentation, and I would just 
encourage everybody, we do have a lot of local resources as far as uh, clinical specialists that their job is to educate on tag interpretation. Uh -huh. So if you have questions at your hospital, you know, reach out to us and let us know and we'd be glad to come out and help you with your program. Yeah, I do think, I do, I do feel that it has tremendous utility. I mean, in all seriousness, it is complex. I don't think it's a very simple. The test itself is relatively simple, and I think that for the average types of the common derangements that we would see, is it normal, not normal, is it surgical, is it, you know, FFP, is it, is it uh, hyperfibrinolysis, whatever the case may be, um, you know, what do we need to do to, to better transfuse this patient? I think um, it has tremendous utility. But I do think that, especially in patients like with the infection problem, and I mean, she, you know, there's a, I have to review this and again before I even can understand what they were really talking about. It's a, <laughs> a coagulation is a very complex thing, and it's uh, it's almost a mystery. You know, it's a mystery, it, it, and it's uh, uh, I think you almost have to be uh, uh, you know omnipotent to uh, completely understand it. It's pretty. It's it's a difficult subject. And, uh, you know, we don't want to make any mistakes, you know. Now, I think it's better than what we have because right now we have a problem. We don't know what we're going to do. We just treat it, you know, we treat this or treat that. We don't know what we're treating. We certainly can learn from it. But for uh, really complex patients, you need to have the support, the buy-in, if you will, of pathology that has a good coagulation expert in that department to help guide this. This I don't really think this should just be thrown out there and anybody use it and could be an expert at it because I don't think they could be. Your thoughts? There's, That's probably not what you wanted me to say tonight, but I said it anyway. Hey, let's talk reality. I mean, you know, I appreciate your opinions on that. And it's all just, it's a team approach. And, you know, you're going to have some things that you see fairly common in cardiac surgery and repetition you're going to get more comfortable with interpreting things and then you're going to have some things that you don't see a whole lot and that's where you need the team to help you out yeah, absolutely you know and it would be really good i don't know if this exists but can we see the other folks too i kind of want to see what their expressions are on this um it'd be really good to have somebody like a Dr. Wagner or a Dr. Uh, Valad available, you know, somebody like them available that can get a tracing sent to them, you know, on a 24 seven basis when it's something that is just out. No, I'm serious. No, I mean that, but, but not you two personally all the time, but a, you know, some resource that you have people within your organization that are out there that take some kind of call and are available to get a tracing that we don't feel comfortable. I think that would that would add a tremendous amount of comfort to me personally if I knew that that type of resource existed. It does. Oh, it does. Okay, so so it does exist. All yeah, right. Well, I, and and I mean, you know, we're not we're not here to practice medicine or anything, but we can give you uh, what the tag says, and obviously, you treat the patient first and. There's a lot of external factors, mm -hmm. but we do have clinical specialists on call that are 24/7, like, like physician level, PhD level, people who are, you know, like like can can give you a medical opinion. Uh, we can talk about what the TEG results say, but as far as a medical opinion, uh, most of our clinical specialists they come from a variety of backgrounds, but usually. They have a very strong uh, nursing or surgery background, mm -hmm. um, but as a manufacturer, we can't practice medicine. Okay, so here's what I want. I, I, Hemodetics is going to have to hire both of you guys. <laughs> it's going to happen. All right, I'm going to make that happen. And, uh, you know, raises for everyone. I want, I want to pay top dollar, and uh, we're going to make that happen. But this has been, for me, a very revealing, very uh, interesting um, conversation. The lectures were fantastic. Uh, I cannot thank both of you enough for taking your, your, your very limited time to come and share all of this. And uh, I'm, you know, overwhelmed with the, uh, with the information and humbled by 
you know, my lack, my own lack of understanding. I think, uh, I, I don't think that I'm unique. I think a lot of people may feel the same way I do. And uh, my hats are off to both of you because you uh, definitely are, uh, are both very, very smart people. And I appreciate you sharing your, your information with us. Oh, what am I supposed to do? What, uh, I'm supposed to read something. Okay. <laughs> do you currently use tags? 60% yes, 40% no. Do you believe that tag is a benefit? 100% said yes, that's good. Do you test platelet function intraoperatively? 80% yes, 20% no. And do you have a specific hematocrit, hematocrit transfer trigger threshold? 60% is yes and 40% is no. We didn't even get into that because it really wasn't the topic, but the question was out there because I do think that we have you know, we all sort of are creatures of habit, which you mentioned, and it's going to be tough, I think, to break the habits. The hematocrit is 24. This person's going to say, give two units of pack cells. Why give one? Two is if you're going to give one, you may as well give two. Another person, they're not going to give anything until 18. And we come up with these numbers and these protocols and algorithms and say, this is what we do. Patients bleeding, we give this, 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 four, 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 two, 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 whatever it is, and then see what's going to happen. And it's untargeted, but it's how it is the real world and how we practice. It's what we do. We, we very rarely really look at something like this. And I think part of that, again, is, and I don't want to belabor the point, is just a lack of good education. I think we need to spend a lot more time understanding TAG and the nuances of coagulation. But it's tough. These folks have spent a, a lifetime, you know, nearly an eternity. You both look very young, though. You probably <laughs> spent a lot of years studying this stuff. And if you, if, if ladies, any final thoughts before we go? Oh, it was an honor for to me to speak yes. in front of you and work together with Julie. And actually, to tell you the truth, my first lectures were her lectures. So I started with her lectures to learn about tech, and then I built my knowledge on. So uh, it takes a, it takes a passion and an effort, but it's a very interesting journey. So thank you so much, too. Thank you, too. And I'm not at all surprised. Julie, I've known Julie many years, and <laughs> she is uh, she's always uh, made me feel very dumb. Julie, <laughs> I love you very much. You guys be safe, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all again very soon. Okay, bye-bye. All right, good night, everybody. Good night, thank you so thank much. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye.
this is Stephanie with HET Perfusion. Oh, okay. We have an open heart one month from today, 9 a.m. start. Oh, really? A single vessel off pump? No problem. Thank you. Hey, Mom, can you bring me a sandwich? Yeah. yeah. You got this urgent letter from the ABCP. Oh wow, I wonder what this could be. Jujo Basha from the ABCP. Wow, this looks official. Dear Certified Clinical Perfusionist, the American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion is advising you that you must submit 10 Category 1 CEU by next week or you will lose your certification. Sincerely, Dave Matthews, PhD, Roger Ramirez, PhD, and the executive co-directors. Let me call my immediate supervisor, Stephanie, and ask her if I can go. This is perfect. Yes, Stephanie. Hi, this is Joe. Hi, Joe. Stephanie, I just got an urgent letter from the ABCP stating that I am 10 CEU short and I've been looking at this New Orleans conference and I'd like to submit my request to go to that because I really need the credits. Uh, geez, Joe, uh, I'm sorry I'm not going to be able to help you. Administration informed me they're denying all meeting requests. I guess you're going to have to find another way to get your seizures. Oh my God. Okay. Uh, there's nothing I can do. You're on your own, Joe. Sorry. I'm taking this up the chain of command. Come in. Dr. McGilvery. Hey, Joe. I don't, <laughs> thank you for seeing me. I don't know what I'm going to do. I do not have enough CEUs to maintain my certification. Joe, so how is that my problem? Our role is to pay you to do perfusion, not to pay you to go take courses. And it was that way in the past, but we just don't have the money to do it anymore. So you're going to have to figure it out on your own. Joe, what's up? Dr. Lumsden. I do not have enough CEUs to maintain my certification, and I'm going to lose my certification. If you can take all the perfusionists away, we can't do any cases. We don't have enough perfusionists. I don't care about these CEUs. It costs too much money. you got to stay here and do these cases. Figure it out some other way you're going to get education. Hey, Joe, you received another uh, urgent letter from the ABCP. Oh, thank you. Dear Certified Clinical Perfusionist, the American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion regrets to inform you that because you lack enough Category 1 CEU, your certification is suspended. You are no longer a certified clinical perfusionist. Oh no. Hmm, I really want to go to this meeting. Hey Joe, you received a letter from your job, man. Hey, dude, thank you so much. Dear Joe, 
Basha. The Health and Happiness Hospital regrets to inform you that because you lost your ABCP certification to a, due to a lack of Category 1 CEUs, you are fired. You must report immediately to the operating room and clean out your locker to make room for your replacement who clearly knew more than you about getting CEUs and maintaining their certification.